Thank you very much. It's, it's great to be here and it's lovely to be with people of so many different faiths. Um, I'm going to do a presentation that's about the science and from a Christian perspective as well. So hopefully the science bit will help inform everything that my colleagues are going to speak about as well. So there's, although there's five numbers on the board, there's three main issues that I'm going to cover. The first one is where we get stem cells from and we're going to use them. The second is the safety issues because I think everything we are going to do for patients needs to avoid harming them and we need to think about that. And then the last three issues, the tissue mashing, the cost, and ethnic minority recipients, they're all sort of examples of justice that we need to make sure that when we develop stem cell treatments, they're available for everybody. And so I'm going to look at those three issues. And because um, I'm going to talk about this from a Christian perspective, I'm going to use this scripture from Micah right the way through the talk. So in Micah, God tells people that they know what he wants of them. He's speaking to um, Jewish people in the Old Testament, but he says that people know what he wants from them. He wants them to do justly, to behave in a just way, to love mercy, to be merciful because he's merciful, and to walk humbly, to not be arrogant, to not be proud. And I think that that's the sort of framework that I want to use as a Christian to think about stem cell ethics because it's got issues of justice, of mercy and humility all wrapped up in it. So first of all, where do we get stem cells from? I think Christians are famous when it comes to stem cell ethics as being seen in the media as against, they're against stem cell treatment, stem cell research. And I think that that's probably um, not a very nuanced perspective. There's a huge range of perspectives within the Christian community about stem cells. But one of the big challenges for the Christian community is to do with the source of the cells that we use. So I'm going to take as fairly uncontroversial all of the adult sources of stem cells that we use because they are given with informed consent of the person involved. So I can donate any of those stem cells for use in science, for use in treatment. I'm also going to take, and you, you might disagree with this, but I'm also going to take amniotic fluid placenta and cord blood as fairly uncontroversial because they're donated by the mother with informed consent. So what, once a mother is um, given birth, she can donate that baby's cord cells for stem cell treatment, so that's, I'm going to take that as uncontroversial. The bit that is more controversial is the pre-embryo and the fetus. So we get pre-embryos from assisted conception. When somebody is infertile and they have assisted conception, um, there's, they, they always have to make more embryos than they will need. They fertilize more ovum than they need. So these fertilized ovum are kept in storage. Now there's a number of, of options that the woman's got at that stage. She can keep them in frozen storage indefinitely for 10 years. At the end of 10 years, they can't stay in storage anymore. This is all governed by the Human Embryo and Fertilization Authority. She could donate them to science, so it could be stem cell treatments, research, it could be helping um, the production of better techniques for assisted conception. She could donate them to another couple who are infertile and can't have their own embryos, or she could just say that she wants them destroyed at that point. So the embryos that are being used by the stem cell scientists are what we call spare embryos. We're not creating embryos deliberately for stem cell research. We're using them as a byproduct of the assisted conception. Um, as far as we can tell, because every stem cell project that uses embryos in the UK has to be registered with the Human Embryo Hem Embryology and Fertilization Authority, there's only three in the UK currently using embryos. So this is, when people think about embryonic stem cell research, there's hardly any of it going on. 
It's, it's really not the majority of stem cell research at all. Fetuses, we, get, we can have fetal material post-termination of pregnancy, post-abortion, or post-miscarriage, or post-stillbirth. So we could take the fetus and take stem cells from it once it's dead. As far as we can tell, there's only one of those projects going on in the UK at the moment, and that's for treatment for strokes. So they're injecting fetal brain cells into people who've had strokes to see if they can improve them at all. So the vast majority of the research is coming from cord blood and the, all of those adult sources of stem cells. Now, when we think about them using the pre-embryo from assisted conception, um, you can see that, um, I can't find a pointer, sorry, but you've got, um, this is just a sort of diagram of fertilization and development of this very, very early embryo. You can see the eight cell stage in the fallopian <coughs> tubes. Between the eight cell and the one next to it, which represents 16 to 32 cells, so that would take day three to four post-conception to get for the for the fertilized ovum to get to that point takes about four days and then right down at the bottom is implantation and that will happen about day five to six of the fertilized ovum's life so when the scientists are um, using embryonic cells for stem cell research they're doing it at the stage of around 32 cell division. So there's about a bundle of about 32 cells. They're just going to develop into this, where it says implantation at the bottom, that's called a blastocyst. So you can see that clump of cells on the right of it. That's, that's where the fetus is going to form from. That's the stage that they're taking those cells from. So when you hear the word embryonic stem cell research, don't think of an embryo as such. It's a group of cells. It's, it hasn't formed into anything yet. It's a group of cells. Now, from a Christian perspective, the fact that it's a group of cells may not matter. Because um, whilst obviously stem cell research isn't, isn't addressed in scripture, there is this scripture from Psalm 139, which Christians across the spectrum will draw on. This, um, this is quite a famous scripture, and it's used in a lot of different contexts. But you can see that, um, that the text is saying that we're God's workmanship. Um, he watched us while we were being formed in utter seclusion, when we were woven together in the dark of the womb. So some Christians will use this to say that God knows us at that cellular stage that it doesn't matter that we're just a group of cells at that point, that at that point of being 32 cells, for some Christians, we've got exactly the same right to life, exactly the same moral status as any of us in the room. So there is a, there's a spectrum of where Christians would be as to what this scripture actually means in terms of stem cell research, but there's no doubt that some Christians will take this very literally and say it doesn't matter that these embryos are just in the cellular stage. We shouldn't do anything to destroy them. And maybe we'll talk about that later. So the second thing that I wanted to talk about was safety. If we are going to do stem cell research and we hope to get it to a point where we can treat people with it, we really must make sure it's safe. And at the moment, we don't have much safety data because it's in such an early stage of its development. What we have got safety data on is um, bone marrow. So bone marrow, when you hear about somebody having a bone marrow transplant, what they're actually having is a stem cell transplant. They're stem cells that live in the bone marrow. So we, we sort of use the slang expression, bone marrow transplant. But what it technically is, is a stem cell transplant. So we've been doing stem cell transplants of bone marrow for 50 years now in the UK. So we've got 50 years of data that safe, that we can think about the safety record of it. And we know that transplanting HSC is hemopoietic stem cells. Hemopoietic cells are the cells that create the blood in our body. We know that hemopoietic stem cells are safe. 
we, we know because we can follow everybody up that's had a bone marrow transplant. What we don't have safety data on is where we use embryonic cells or cells from a fetus and put them in a human being. We know that when we do it with animals, these cells often um, change into cancerous cells. And so that's a great worry. And there's a lot of um, trials going on to try and make the technique much safer. IPS cells are induced pluripotent cells. So what they do with those is that, that list of adult cells that we looked at, so blood, urine, skin, what they do there is take one of those cells and treat it with chemicals to trick it to believe that it hasn't yet become a, a skin cell, to try and make it think it's one of those cells that was involved in that 32 cell ball. So they try and make it think it's in a much earlier stage of its development than it actually is. It hasn't yet known it's a, it's a skin cell. And so the induced pluripotent cells are the cells that create the most tumours as they carry on and grow. And they are really unsafe. We don't transplant them at all. They're still at the stage of, in the research labs and being used on animals. So the Israeli boy at the bottom is a, a young gentleman from Israel who went to Russia where they are doing some um, fetal stem cells and he had fetal cells put into his brain. Um, he had some sort of brain tumour and he'd had it removed but they were trying to um, get some of his brain to regenerate and they put stem cells in from a fetus and he developed tumours throughout his body. So where it's unregulated and it's happening, it's producing cancers, which is why we won't regulate it until we're much more certain about the safety of it. But then we have to think about, well, what would be a reasonable time to wait for safety data? If somebody gave me stem cells now, how long should we wait to see whether I develop a tumour or not? Should we wait a month, six months, a year, two years? The problem is the longer that we wait, the more we're hindering science. But So we've got to reach this compromise between how much science should we allow and how much risk should we accept while we're wondering about the safety. Um, in terms of what safety issues could arise, it's not just tumours. It's the fact that once these cells are put into the body, they can go anywhere within the body and do anything they want within the body because we haven't got control mechanisms in place that tell the cell what you want it to do. The cell is at liberty to change in any way it wants. So there's been, um, it, there are some unregulated procedures where people are having stem cells put into their wrinkles under their eyes and so they put fat stem cells to try and get rid of their wrinkles. And that they, some people have had to go back and had bone taken out from under their eyelids because the stem cell they put in didn't know it was meant to regenerate wrinkles. It's changed itself into um, a cell that will produce bone. That's horrific. So we can't, we can't pursue this until we know it's safe. And... Um, so that was the sort of safety issues that we would need to be quite certain about. The third issue that I wanted to talk about is all to do with justice and equity. So those stem cells that we saw in the pre-embryo that were 32 cells, they, have all, they already know what tissue type they're going to be. I don't mean what tissue they're going to create. I mean, um, in terms of what, what people are they going to be compatible with. So we can't take one of my stem cells and give it to Penemy. We can't give it to anybody who isn't Caucasian and from my tissue type because their body would reject it. So the way that we deal with this, it's exactly the same problem as we have with solid organ transplants. I can't give my liver to Penemy. She, her body would reject it. It would kill her. So when we do tissue, uh, sorry, when we do organ transplants, we try and get as close a match as we can. 
but then we've got to give immunosuppressant. Got to that patient will have to take drugs for the rest of their life that will stop them rejecting that organ. It's exactly the same as stem cells. You can't just give anybody any stem cell. It's all got to be tissue typed. It's all got to be matched. So because we are such a diverse society, there's a lot of research going on about how many different types would we need. And this research from The Lancet is saying that we'd need about 150 different tissue matched samples in order to cover the population. Which doesn't sound very much, but then when you read the evidence further, it only covers 68% of the population, not 100% of the population. And the 68% of the population it covers are the Caucasian people. It doesn't cover people who are non-Caucasian because they are far harder to match, to match tissue. So I think as a Christian I would want to, I would want to ask the question, are we going to pursue stem cell research that creates greater health inequalities than we already have at present? And we have health inequalities across ethnic diversity at present. Are we going to make it even worse? by setting up a system where it's the Caucasian patients who are going to get access to it and not the non-Caucasian patients because there just isn't stem cells for them. Another issue we have to think of in terms of justice is the finance of stem cells. So we have no idea how much this will cost because we're nowhere close to actually bringing it into normal medical practice and being able to cost it. All we can go back to is the cost data on bone marrow transplants. So at the moment, this is all from Anthony Nolan Research Institute, which is the institute that administers the bone marrow bank. Um, if I needed a bone marrow transplant, it would cost the NHS £13,000 to buy my bone marrow cells from Anthony Nolan. If Penemy, I'm picking on Penemy because she's my friend, um, if Penemy needed a bone marrow transplant and she wasn't readily matched in the UK, she may well be, but just if she wasn't, it would cost around 70000 to bring those cells from a country where she could have a match. So they would fly them in frozen. So that gives you an idea about... Um, some challenge that the NHS has got to face. If we want to be equitable and fair, it's going to be the most expensive option, not the cheapest option. If we go for the cheapest option, then we'll only be treating the Caucasian population predominantly. So we have got some options of what to do. We could have, where it says donor or autologous, if we have donor cells, which is the system we've got, we're working on at the moment, um, we'll have all this tissue matching problem. If we have autologous, that means that when I need some stem cells because I've got leukemia or bowel cancer or Parkinson's disease, whatever it is, then the scientists could take my own stem cells and treat them however they need to treat them and then give them me back so that I could be healed by my own cells. So that's obviously going to be the most expensive option. If everybody's got to have access to their own cells, be treated in this really unique way, that's the most expensive option. So what the government's trying to do at the moment is increase the number of cells we've got available, trying to get a really big bank of cells that hopefully we won't need to all have our own cells given back. So they're aiming for 50,000 units of cord blood. And they're, they're putting all of their resources into delivery suites where babies are being born in areas of greatest ethnic diversity. So the women's hospital here has got a range of nurses paid for by Anthony Mo Nolan Bone Marrow Register who are trying to get the cord blood of women from ethnically diverse populations to get them to put their, their cord blood from their babies into the bank. Now, they won't be able to get their cord blood back if their baby develops an illness, 
that cord blood will be held for the whole of the population. But it's still going to leave us with the problem that lots of people will not be matched readily at all. So we're still left with this scripture. I think that this is a, I don't have an answer at all, but they're the things that I am concerned about as a Christian. Um, that I want to do justly. And I don't see the system at the moment being just because it's got all these inequalities in built into it by the virtue of cost and difficulty in matching tissue. I want to love mercy. I want to be merciful to the people who are ill. And being unequal is not being merciful. And I want to walk humbly. I don't want to assume that because science can do it and science has so many great answers that we should pursue the scientific imperative at all costs. I think we need to be humble about it and say what we can do, what we can't do, and where we want to end up. Thank you.